Good morning and welcome everyone to worship wherever you are today, whether you're joining us uh, online on your screen at home, whether you will be worshiping outdoors with us at 9.30, whether you'll be watching our Facebook Live at 9.30, we are delighted to be able to be the church. May God bless us as we worship together. We're continuing our summer reading worship series, the integration, the intersection of scripture with uh, books and articles that we read Excited today to share the story uh, of Eliza Hamilton. All of you Hamilton musical aficionados uh, will take note. Next Sunday, I'm going to be teaching about the life of St. Augustine. It's uh, poignant in this time of college and college scandals. The sermon is called Varsity Blues. I want to lift up our council meeting from August 18th. The slide says August 17th. We had a meeting where we asked ourselves, how can we continue to be faithful to Christ and his call to be among God's people that are are God's healing and saving and serving instruments? We follow the uh, guidance of our bishop and the Wisconsin Council of Churches who have said to churches in in Wisconsin, don't be in a rush to open. Uh, Be aware, as we are this past week, that there were close to 1,000 persons infected on on Friday in in our areas, and and we just want to be careful. And so we've decided not to open up our building in September. We're going to revisit on September 15th with our council meeting and ask about uh, next steps. Meanwhile, we're opening up our outdoor worship on September 13th, Rally Sunday, to include two worship services at 9.15 and 10.45. Uh, Kara and Ann and Troy are launching Blast and uh, Youth Ministry that day. Watch for their invitations to participate. That won't be in the building either, however. Uh, Pastor Kevin is launching Confirmation, excited by the hard work of these teams, and invite and encourage your participation. God overcomes all things, and let's stay the course together. Let's worship God. Hey, church, welcome to Digital Worship. I'm glad you're tuning in, and I'd love to sing with you. It's good to be the church together. This is Reckless Love.
this part together. There's no shadow you won't light up. There's no shadow you won't light up. Fountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. Sing it again. There's no shadow. Let's worship together. If I were to ask you, who are your closest friends? Who would you name? What makes them a close friend? Is it because they're fun to be with? Is it because you can trust them with a secret? Or is it because you know they have your back? No matter what trouble you get into, they're ready to help. You know, God wants to be that kind of friend to you. All you have to do is spend time with him and talk to him. You see, God is like this cup, and this is you. Sometimes when we have problems, we let them come between us and God. We say to ourselves, I've got this. I can take care of this on my own. But when we fall, God is always ready to catch us, every time. So how can you spend time with God? For some people, they feel the closest to God at church. But you can find a special place in your house where you spend time with Jesus regularly. You can talk to him. You can sing with him. You can read the Bible or a children's Bible storybook. There are even some good videos, like Veggie Tales. Or maybe the time that you spent with Jesus is around the kitchen table with your family, praying before a meal, or praying at bedtime. Those are all good ways to keep close with God, because God loves you, and so do I. Welcome back, everyone, to our worship series, Summer Reading. We are intersecting the truths of the Bible with popular books and articles. Uh, wherever you're worshiping today, whether you're at home uh, watching a screen, whether you're watching Facebook Live uh, at our Atonement uh, Facebook site at 9.30, or gathering in person uh, outdoors at 9.30, it is a, a blessing to be able to worship God with you. I pray that God will uh, guide us as his followers today. We are looking into the uh, 16th chapter of Luke today to, uh, to frame our uh, message this morning. And in fact, I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. There was an interesting um, online excerpt from Bono 
the lead singer of U2, uh, of U2 this week, uh, talking about how he struck up a, a friendship with Eugene Peterson prior to uh, Pastor Peterson's death a couple of years ago. And, uh, and in fact, as it turned out, Eugene Peterson didn't have any idea who Bono and U2 were when this rock star reached out to him and told him that he had opened up God's word to him. So uh, the 16th chapter of Luke, the story of the crooked manager. Jesus said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager. He got reports that the manager had been taking advantage of his position and running up huge personal expenses. So he called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? You're, you're fired and I want a complete audit of your books. Well, the manager said to himself, what am I going to do? I've lost my job as a manager. I'm not strong enough for a laboring job. I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I've got a plan. Here's what I'll do. Then when I'm turned out into the street, people will take me into their homes. And then he went at it. One after another, he called in the people who were in debt to his master. He said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He replied, a hundred jugs of olive oil. The manager said, here, take your bill, sit down, quick now, write 50. He said to the next, and what do you owe? He answered, 100 sacks of wheat. He said, take your bill, write in 80. Now here's the surprise. The master praised the crooked manager. And why? Because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They're on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right, using every adversity to stimulate you to creative survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you'll live, really live, not just complacently getting by on good behavior. And Jesus went on to make these comments. If you're honest in small things, you're honest in big things. If you're a crook in small things, you're a crook in big things. If you're not honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? No worker can serve two bosses. He'll hate the first and love the second or adore the first and despise the second. You can't serve both God and the bank. When the Pharisees, a money-obsessed bunch, heard him say these things, they rolled their eyes, dismissing him as hopelessly out of touch. And so Jesus spoke to them. You are masters at making yourselves look good in front of others, but God knows what's behind the appearance. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, I've asked uh, Katie Klinert to sing us into this sermon. Here's an excerpt from a song from the musical Hamilton called Burn. I saved every letter you wrote me From the moment I read them I knew you were mine said you were mine, I thought you were mine. Do you 
burn. Anne and I watched the musical Hamilton last fall. It, it has stayed with me every, ever since, that, that music, the story. Didn't you love, if you saw Hamilton, didn't you just love King George III? Oceans rise, empires fall. <laughs> All that music, as uh, Lynn manuel Miranda, the author, said, it's the uh, history of the United States and Alexander Hamilton told in a modern way with uh, hip-hop and rap and song and dance. All according to the uh, history as told by Ron Chernow, a book that I read and you can see here, which is the, um, the story, the biography of Alexander Hamilton. And uh, after reading that and seeing the musical, I still didn't have my uh, full Hamilton fix. So when I saw this book in the library, the a story of the wife of Alexander Hamilton, The Extraordinary Life and Times of Eliza Hamilton. Uh, I read that too. Well, you might know the story of the, the guy whose face occupies our $10 bill. As you can see, Alexander Hamilton. And you might be somewhat familiar with the story of this uh, guy who was born, uh, the Ill illegitimate uh, child, uh, on a remote uh, Caribbean island, this remote English and French speaking island who, who grew up in, in poverty there as a child, uh, orphaned by his mother, abandoned by his father, and, uh, and yet recognized by a teacher as someone with some gifts. And in their little village, uh, they put together enough money to send him to the American colonies that were taking shape where he could receive and education, and how this orphan from a Caribbean island arose to become uh, the right-hand man of General George Washington, serving as his aide-de-camp throughout the Revolutionary War, finally uh, twisting General Washington's arm at the decisive Battle of Yorktown to run an assault on, on the, the British there and winning that battle and the decisive battle of the Revolutionary War when Hamilton from there uh, wrote about 75% of the papers, the Federalist papers that became the undergird, undergirding for our United States Constitution when he became uh, George Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, served on his cabinet, and, and of course you might know of the senseless death when Alexander Hamilton was shot by the Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr. Uh, that's the story we may be familiar with, but it's the story that his, his wife tells, the story that um, Tyler Maceo tells when she wrote the biography of the extraordinary life and times of Eliza Hamilton that reveals uh, more of the truth. In fact, the, the story behind the scenes is much more like the Bible story that frames this sermon, the story of a crooked manager. Alexander Hamilton was um, well known as uh, being a person who uh, was a creature of his sexual appetites. And it's accepted history uh, in the book that Ron Chernow writes and as faithfully followed by Lin-Manuel Miranda in the musical Hamilton, that Alexander had an affair with a, a woman named Mariah Reynolds. Uh, up to that point, um, he was thought to have been faithful to his wife, Eliza, even though as a young man before his marriage to Eliza, he apparently had a well-known uh, reputation for, for not uh, being so monogamous. But uh, faithful to his wife Eliza, and in fact believed by her to their death likely to have been faithful in spite of the accepted history, that he had an affair in the summer of 1791 with a Mariah Reynolds, a woman whose reputation was uh, not good in, its, in her own right. And as the story unfolded, the accepted history is that while Eliza was away that summer with their two or three young children up to Albany, New York, staying with her family in the hot summer months. And Alexander remains back in New York City, working hard at work as a secretary of the treasury. 
he had this dalliance with Mariah Reynolds, and they were discovered as it went by her husband, or, or perhaps Mariah was in it all along, uh, because the next thing that happened is that Alexander is being blackmailed in order to keep that affair a secret. Uh, a politician pays money in order to cover up a sexual affair. It sounds like a modern story, and it all is what is the accepted history, but not without question, and even in those times, uh, particularly by a couple of Alexander Hamilton's bitter political foes, uh, a couple of gentlemen who would serve terms as president of the United States by the name of Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe. When, uh, when they asked for evidence on the uh, blackmail, Hamilton alleged publicly that there were letters that he had received, uh, blackmail letters that he'd received, but he was never willing to turn them over for handwriting analysis in order to determine if those letters were actually forgeries that he himself had written. And why would he have written forgeries and about an affair that he had? Why would we, he admit publicly to this affair at all and destroy his political career uh, only possibly to cover up something even worse. It was also well known in that time, those years that Alexander served as the first secretary of the treasury, that his own family, his in-laws, his relatives and his associates made a lot of money during what was emerging as the, the financial investments of the period. This was all the primitive age of, of the beginnings of the stock market. They, they wouldn't have that infamous uh, investing association that traded stocks beneath the buttonwood tree on Wall Street until the year after the alleged Mariah Reynolds affair. But by then, through the financial wheelings of, and dealings of establishing the federal banking system, the undergirding of the United States uh, national uh, economy and banking system, Hamilton's family and associates had, had made a lot of money, and uh, the allegations were that there had been what we eventually would coin as insider trading. Uh, uh, and, and Hamilton was accused not of paying off a blackmail uh, to, uh, to Mariah Reynolds and her husband James to keep their affair a secret, but rather that in order for him to to profit from these illicit financial transactions, he had been giving James money to invest on his behalf and also paying James to do so, and that the affair had been conjured up in order to protect the family from this much more dangerous um, bit of intrigue. What, what's true? What actually happened? We don't really know. We only know that at some point in that period of time, Eliza burned all of the letters and all of the correspondence. It's well documented that, um, that many of, of Hamilton's family uh, or his associates, through their financial uh, misdeeds, ran into bankruptcy. And there was this horrid reality in that time called debtor's prison. Eliza Hamilton herself might have had little interest in whatever was going on financially or may have found it as confusing as I do, uh, but we do know that as someone devoted to Christian good works, she had visited these associates in debtor's prison. She'd seen the horrible conditions that some of them died under and that she feared, no doubt, if any of these allegations were true, that all of this would come crashing down upon everything that was dear to her, not just her husband, but her father and her sisters and her in-laws. And, and so the allegations were that uh, she herself may have been part of covering up this incident. If it happened, it was much more dangerous than simply an affair. Well, it's complicated, isn't it? What is the truth? We may never know because as the song in the musical Hamilton alludes, the letters uh, that 
that Eliza had received from, from Alexander during that period of time explaining what was going on uh, were burned. There is, in fact, a, a verse captured in the song Burn that refers to a life burned by deceit. You published the letters she wrote you. You told the whole world how you brought this girl into our bed. In clearing your name, you have ruined our lives. In clearing your name, you have ruined our lives. And our world seemed to burn. Burn. Was the alleged affair a massive cover-up for a crime even worse? Mariah Reynolds was not an admired person, nor her husband James. She, uh, he, they had reputations. But Mariah Reynolds maintained to her grave that the affair with Alexander Hamilton never happened. Did Hamilton and uh, James Reynolds throw Mariah under the bus in order to save their own skins from the public scandal involving their lust for money and power? We'll never know. The evidence was burned. The truth may be that Eliza took one for the team. She may have joined in the cover-up in order to save her husband, her family, her relatives, her friends, and her country, which was embroiled in this massive political conflict, the early emergence of what became our two-party system, having at it in the elections at the turn of the 19th, 18th to the 19th century, the conflict between Hamilton and George Washington's Federalists and the emerging Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. Hamilton opposed Jefferson's uh, Democratic Republicans because they advocated for a land-owning agrarian economy that was built on the back of slaves. Jefferson opposed Hamilton's Federalists because of their nationalizing the system of money around federal banks, around Wall Street, and wealthy financiers. If Jefferson and Monroe were right that Hamilton was a crook, what would happen to the federal banking system that was the economic basis for the existence of the infant United States of America? It was a horrible shame for Eliza to do so, but perhaps she did the best she could in order not to make things worse for everyone, for her marriage, for her children, for her relatives, and for her country. If true, the burning of the letters makes Eliza an unwitting partner in covering up her husband's crooked financial schemes. But it also illustrates our faith. Think of this, listen again, to Jesus, praise the crooked manager. Luke 16. Now here's a surprise. The master praised the crooked manager, and why? Because he knew how to look after himself. Jesus said, streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They're on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits, I wish you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right. If you're honest in small things, you're honest in big things. If you're a crook in small things, you're a crook in big things. No worker can serve two bosses. He'll hate the first and love the second or adore the first and despise the second. You can't serve both God and the bank. Am I wrong about this theory? Is Tyler Maceo, the author of the Eliza Hamilton biography, wrong? It could be. We'll never know. Because all of the correspondence has been burned. It's ironic because Eliza saved everything else that she ever received from Alexander. She saved, in fact, her the last letter she received, written just before what Alexander referred to as his interview with Aaron Burr. He urged her to turn to God. He wrote, 
This letter, my dear Eliza, will not be delivered to you unless I shall have terminated my earthly career. The consolations of religion, my beloved, can alone support you, and these you have a right to enjoy. Fly to the bosom of your God and be comforted. With my last idea, I shall cherish the sweet hope of meeting you in a better world. Adieu, best of wives and best of women. Embrace all my darling children for me, ever yours. A. H. July 4th, 1804. Eliza did turn to Jesus. After his death, she was like a drowning woman clinging to the hope that she would see him again in heaven. She lived another 50 years after Alexander's death. She died at age 97. Alexander left her and their seven children, age 16 and younger, in huge financial jeopardy and debt. But Eliza found a way forward. She reorganized all of his letters and papers and writings. She persuaded the government to purchase the papers, the Federalist Papers, and and all of the writings that had undergirded the foundation of the United States Constitution that Alexander had written. She managed through many, many years of setbacks to finally have the first biography of her dear husband published. But in all of these writings, there was never a mention of the Mariah Reynolds affair or or any uh, financial misdeeds. She rallied to support the early years of the Republic, the United States, working with the wives of the former presidents with Dolly Madison and with Louisa Adams to raise funds for what became the cornerstone of what we now know as the Mall in Washington, D.C. and the financing of the Washington Monument. She followed her husband's lead in tireless campaigning to abolish slavery, interviewed late in her life by James Polk, who found her to be winsome and crisp and intelligent in her 90s as she advocated for the abolition of slavery uh, with the years not far away by then, the late 1840s and the Civil War around the corner. She founded, two years after Alexander's death, a, with the support of other women, the Orphan Asylum Society, the first orphanage ever in New York, City, New York City. She remained an officer of that orphanage for 42 years, serving as president for 27 years. That orphanage still exists as the oldest child welfare agency in America, serving nearly 5,000 children every year Her beloved Alexander was not the last orphan to be given a chance in America. Eliza Hamilton was far from a perfect person. Some years after his presidency, an aged James Monroe arranged a a personal visit with her. All those years, Eliza had especially blamed him for the politics that had ruined her Alexander, her husband's career. Monroe approached her in that visit, saying, we've reached an age where past differences must be forgiven and forgotten. Eliza responded, if you have come to repent that you are very sorry for the slanders you circulated against my dear husband, no lapse of time, no nearness to the grave make any difference. And that was that. Did Eliza take one for the team and burn the correspondence that might have set history straight? We'll never know. What remains is the age in which we live, this age where we are the managers, the managers of our livelihoods, of the way we raise our incomes, the managers managers of our marriages, the managers of our families and our children, managers of our, of our businesses and our associations, managers of this nation. 
at every step we know the truth, we often can be crooked managers looking for angles, surviving by our wits. Yet through it all, though we ourselves often do what compromises the good, God burns through the chaff of our lives and history with the truth of Jesus Christ and his word and the calling to each of us. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They're on constant alert, Jesus said, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. I want you to be smart in the same way. But for what is right. Let's take time now to pray together. I want to invite your prayer requests uh, at our website, the uh, drop-down under About Atonement. You can see the invitation to write and send us your prayer requests. We are aware of three families connected to our congregation that are affected by COVID-19 diagnoses. We invite prayers for all who suffer not only locally, but around the world, and especially for those people on the front line of service, hospital workers, law enforcement professionals, those uh, who are essential workers everywhere, who who drive the buses, who do the picking up of trash, who help us stay with food and and our essential needs. We thank God for them and, and do our part with our physical distancing and our mask wearing to, uh, to be part of God's healing work. Well, let's, um, let's join in prayer together. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. God, we look with you today as you open up for us the story of the crooked manager with a confession that we in our lives often fall short of what you call for us and often display uh, that which is not good. We ask, God, that you would uh, give us the, the moral compass to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and your commandments, that we might uh, manage our lives, our livelihoods, our sources of income with honesty and integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we confess to you that often our families, our marriages themselves are under stress, that we uh, can be crooked in our dealings, and we lay that before you with honest confession and a need for your Holy Spirit to enliven our relationships, to bless our children and grandchildren. We pray for them, God, now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We look with you, God, in this uh, intense political situation at those who are striving to serve and to represent and to lead in public office, and we pray for all of them today. We pray for discernment in our voting, that we would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and your desire that our votes would be a way that politics helps people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Christ, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting your mercy. Amen. Well, we want to worship God now with our tithes and offerings, and I was excited to see as I was thumbing through our Atonement Facebook page this slide from our friends in Tepeagua that Cindy Dostal, who's leading up our El Salvador partnership with the support of so many people like Renee Statler and Nancy Hanks and a host of people that uh, surround her in, in supporting our partnership. She'd gotten this note from... Um, from Pastor Margarita and a couple of the ladies there, uh, Ruth and Ceci Bell. And in Spanish, if I can see quickly, it says uh, that we are honored to tell and to show, to to express our appreciation for the angels of God and the representation of Pastor Margarita and the work that we do together in the Committee of Health, the Directiva that runs our community, uh, the school sponsorships, Habitat for Humanity projects, health promotion, and all of the things that we are doing together. And we especially want to give thanks for our brothers and partners at Atonement Lutheran Church. Uh, for, who provides so much support always. You are always welcome in our community. God bless you. A welcome in Christ. 
it's a beautiful note that reminds us we have so much to thank, be thankful for in, in our generosity as we think about managing all that God has given us. We invite continued generosity. Thank you for your generosity. We're mindful that so many people around the country and locally uh, are under financial stress. So thank you so much. Sending in checks as you uh, have been doing faithfully. Um, going online, clicking PayPal for your donations at our website. Uh, setting up Simply Giving for electronic transfers of offering each month. Over 100 families take advantage of that opportunity. Let us know if we can set you up. And, and finally, our new text to give. Simply text the amount to 414-626-9700. Follow the prompts on the screen. Let's worship God now with our tithes and offerings. When the weight of life begins to fall On the name of Jesus I God is in control, and His purpose is unshakable. Doesn't matter what I feel, doesn't matter what I see, my hope will always be in Your promises to me. Now I'm casting up. to the days to come I will not forget what you have done for you have supplied my every need and your presence is enough for me doesn't matter what I feel doesn't matter Let's pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let's join T-Bone Larson for our dismissal at the Outdoor Worship Center. Let's sing together. This is Yes, I Will. count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out working all things out yes I will lift you high Can we sing that one more time? Yes, I will. Thank you.